Volume 1, Chapter 77 The King's Followers You are listening at NovelFull.audio Race Goblin Level 72 Class Lord, Horde Chief Possessed Skills Ruler of the Horde, Defiant Soul, Overpowering Howl, Swordsmanship B+, Insatiable Desire, King's Soul, Ruler's Wisdom I, One That I'd Snake's Evil I, Dance at Death's Border, Magic Manipulation, Soul of a Crazed Warrior, Third Impact, The Third Chant, Instinct, Ruler's Wisdom II, Divine Protection. Goddess of the Underworld Attributes Darkness, Death Subordinate Beasts High Cobalt Hesu, LV1, Gastra, LV20, Cynthia, LV20, Orc King Bui, LV40, they hurled attacks at the Ogre Lord one after another, yet the Ogre Lord remained unscathed. GUOA With every howl that bellowed from the Ogre Lord's lips, the skills they casted were cancelled. G.I. Za shot his skills one after another, while G.I. Go Amatsuki discreetly attacked with his only remaining sword, but the Ogre Lord remained unharmed. It was as if it had received some divine protection keeping him from harm. Whether it was from in front, behind, or even down at its legs, not a scratch could be left on its body. What the hell is that freak? Rashka complained through his ragged breath. The haphazard use of the black light had taken a toll on him. A divine protection, perhaps. Alyahalia's brows knitted. In the first place, it was plenty strange that it was even here. This was the holy land of the goblins, home of the revered Lord of Decay. No one can enter this place without his permission. If so, then. No, Alyahalia shook his head, stopping his thoughts. I'll go for his eyes. Cover me. Princess Narsa said. The other two goblins nodded, and Princess Narsa pulled an arrow from her quiver. Arrow feathers. The arrowhead burned a fist dot sized flame. The eyes were the weakness of all creatures. Even the ogre lord shouldn't be an exception, but it was too tall. Whether it was Alyahalia who rode on the back of a rider dot beast or Rashka who boasted a tall stature, none could reach past the ogre lord's hands. It was too dangerous to bet everything on one shot. If even a single one of them were to go down, the damage dealt to their strength would be too great. Don't rush. We'll do this slow and steady. Alyahalia said. Rashka, Alyahalia, and Gilmi covered Narsa as she shot her arrows. But, since none of their attacks could work against the enemy, then, of course, neither would they work for cover. You dare. The Ogre Lord grew irritated at their relentless attack. Earth, tremble for me. Grand slam, the giant axe descended upon the ground, and the earth shook, breaking the balance of the charging goblins, forcing Narsa and Gilmi's arrows to miss. My heart rides on the wind. Windia, the air shook, and four small tornadoes sprouted around the goblin rare. They struck against the ogre lord only to be dispelled with a blow, but that was more than enough to stop it in its tracks. Damn it! Our attacks are just barely enough to stop it from moving. G.I. Za grew impatient as he felt his ether drying. There was little hope to victory from the start, but now, the battle was growing desperate. Still, they couldn't stop. The murderer of the king could not be forgiven. Sky, tremble for me. Rue Grand Slam, but, it was in that moment of hesitation, that the ogre lord's voice bellowed. It swung its axe, tearing through the air as its frenzied howl bellowed. The axe did not touch the ground, but the earth shook all the same, and the air lashed itself against the petrified goblins. The goblins have been fighting all this time bloodied and bruised, so, it was no tall tale to say that that one attack was enough to put a stop to them. G.I. Za himself was already tottering about as his ether neared empty, and whatever remained of his strength left as that one attack threw him off his feet. Damn, it. Are we, so powerless, that we, can't even, take, vengeance? G.I. Za's bones creaked as he forced his body to stand. And when he did, he saw the ogre lord set its sights on Alyahalia. Like a strong wind. Like a whirlwind. 
Wind cutter, clouds of dust rose as two blades of wind tried to stop the ogre lord, but the price for that was the last of his ether. If you want to die that badly, then I'll start with you. The ogre lord mocked as it approached, then it swung its axe. He felt death come upon him, and he smiled. King. I, my body is like a cloud of dust. Excel, then in the next moment, a familiar back appeared before him. Impossible, that nostalgic voice, that ever dot familiar chant. It was as if. Do the dead dream, king. The king turned to him and laughed. I'll listen to your complaints later. There was no mistaking it. As soon as he realized that, an inexplicable emotion welled forth from inside him, and he couldn't look up. What was that? That burning heat that gushed forth from within, filling every corner of his body. Can you fight, G.I. Za? The king asked, but his back commanded him differently. Stand up and fight. It said. That majestic back full of dignity and glory was the back he had sworn to follow. And so, with shaking hands and creaking arms, and though his legs begged at him to stop as he twisted them back, G.I. Za stood up. But, of course. Who do you think I am? He would stand together with him and fight. There was no greater joy than that. Even if he had no more strength, and even if his ether had gone dry, he would stand with the king. Then, somehow someway, he felt the wind blow within. I invocate Excel, and rammed my body against the Ogre Lord. The Ogre Lord was caught unguarded and was thrown off. I used that opportunity to check up on G.I. Zhao. Do the dead dream, King. He asked in a shaking voice I was not familiar with. Looks like he knew about my death. Coming back to life after that is a crazy story wherever you go, it's not strange he can't believe his eyes. But, now's not the time. I'll listen to your complaints later. I told him. Cuts littered his body and his ether had dried up, but aside from that, he didn't seem that hurt. Can you fight, G.I. Za? Stand up and fight, G.I. Za. I need your power to defeat that thing. But, of course. Who do you think I am? Arrogant as ever. But, it wouldn't do any good if you weren't like that. Weakness doesn't suit you. This is, G.I. Za muttered, and I turned around, though I kept an eye out for the Ogre Lord. And there, I saw G.I. Za kneeling as a black light covered him. Is he, evolving? The already human dot like appearance grew even more human as his body transformed. The bluish dot white skin of his was the only thing that marked him inhuman. Be no calm, he had five fingers, and his height reached only up my chest. He was small but not overly for a human. And while he had a cold countenance that seemed to speak of his wisdom, he was handsome nevertheless. Damn it, I'm actually worse off than a beast. Name. G.I. are race. Goblin level. Three class. Shaman, sub, leader possessed skills. Magic manipulation, three verse chant, chant cancel, guidance of the god of wisdom, wind guard, adherent of the king, wind control, ether movement, divine protection. Wind god attributes. Wind his class has changed from a druid to a shaman. Speaking of which, isn't this my first time seeing his status? It's been so long since the last time, I'd forgotten what it feels like to evolve. G.I. Za calmly analyzed himself. Too calm, even. He's reached a class equal to those of the nobles, so I'll have to give him a new name. King, he called. It's coming. There was no need to ask what was coming for a fearsome howl pierced my ears in the next moment. Cover me, I told him. Leave it to me, he replied. And like that, the curtains on our battle against the Ogre Lord was drawn once more. Volume 1, Chapter 78 Wind Shaman You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Race Goblin Level 72 Class Lord, Horde Possessed Skills Chief Ruler of the Horde, Defiant Soul, Overpowering Howl, Swordsmanship B+, 
insatiable desire, king soul, ruler's wisdom I, one that I'd snake's evil I, dance at death's border, magic manipulation, soul of a crazed warrior, third impact, the third chant, instinct, ruler's wisdom too, divine protection. Goddess of the Underworld Attributes Darkness, Death Subordinate Beasts High Cobalt Hesu, LV1, Gastra, LV20, Cynthia, LV20, Orc King Bui, LV40, after Gi Za evolved into a shaman, we ran for the ogre lord who was howling mad. Can we win? He asked. Leave it to me, I said back. Using the skill, I searched for the ogre lord's weakness. I don't know if it's because of the four treasures or because of my newly learned, but the ogre lord's howls no longer cancelled my spells. The ogre lord's weakness lay at the soles of its feet. No wonder we couldn't scratch it. Now that we know, we'll have to find a way to topple it. But it won't be easy. That giant axe has a long reach, getting past it will take a lot of effort. It's a pity I've lost my great sword. If I still had it with me, receiving a blow from that axe might have been possible. The soles of its feet are its weakness. We'll have to topple it over, then attack. What do you think? I think we're gonna have to send him off with a bang. G.I. Za smiled fearlessly. How reliable, but then the ogre lord's axe came swinging. Earth, tremble for me, grand slam, the earth trembled, toppling us as cracks extended from where the giant axe struck. Sky, tremble for Meru grand slam. Then the air trembled, and a ball of wind shot forth. I'll take that as a challenge. G.I. Za smiled fearlessly as he stood back up and chanted a spell. O oh, exalted one, hear my call kryz. O oh, god of wind, let thy strength manifest unto this world, a spearcaster lance. That last chant was longer than usual, but he spoke the words quickly. A large amount of ether gathered in G.I. Za's right hand, condensing into a spear of wind. G.I. Za used that spear to meet the ogre lord's ball of wind head on. A cyclone erupted as the two forces clashed and clouds of dust whirled as small stones shot from time to time. Narrowing my eyes, I pushed onward toward the Ogre Lord. You little. The Ogre Lord was visibly irritated. Now, who told you I was done? Using the whirling wind, Giza chanted another spell. Rise sickle dot neck storm. The whirling wind turned at Giza's command, toward the Ogre Lord. Clouds of dust rose with it, and they moved as one. I walked under the cover of their veil, unseen by all. When the ogre lord swept the wind away with its axe, I was right at its chest. The ether I'd taken from Varid coursed through my right arm, but the ogre lord noticed me, and it bellowed out a howl, scattering the ether I'd gathered. Goryuayuye. As I thought, point blank is too close. Like this I can't use my ether. In that case, I'll just have to burn my ether from within. I still remember G.I. Za's words, but there's no other choice. I have to gamble it. Inner control isn't easy, I know that. To bolster strength with ether, for example, one would have to infuse the ether into his muscles, carefully directing the flow, making sure it doesn't go out of control. One step wrong, and it wouldn't end simply with the spell fizzling out like it does with a fireball. The affected part would get ripped apart, and in my case, that would mean my right arm would become useless again. But there's no other choice. Nothing else can move this hulking creature. Not to mention I don't even have my great sword with me. So I let the ether flow into my right arm. Carefully, making sure not a drop leaks out. And I have to do so with resolve. If I hesitate for even a moment, that axe will come swinging at me. Goo, a little ether leaked out, and I felt some of the veins underneath my flesh burst. But I gritted on, and I slammed my fist against the Ogre Lord's flank. It felt like hitting a tire as the Ogre Lord's flank sank. Gu, go away. The Ogre Lord let out a cry from the pain. Of course, that wasn't actually enough to wound it. At most, it would just push it back. Eat this. Again, 
I infused ether into my right fist, and I slammed it against the gore. My shoddy ether control made the blood burst out of my right arm. The ogre lord squirmed in pain, but the bloodied one was me. Damn you! The ogre seethed in rage as it swung its axe down toward me. Burned in full fervor, bringing my strength and defense to the limits. I can't retreat. If I falter here, the ogre lord won't let me near it again. I looked up the descending axe. Ether coursed into my fist as it brimmed with power. I'll have to meet it head on. In that same moment, activated, increasing both the damage I dealt and received. I don't know how it'll interact with my skill that enhances defense, but if I don't use this now, I'll just get crushed by that axe. G-U-R-U-A As I activated my skill, I controlled the ether within. My body screamed abuse, as vessels and veins burst one after another, bloodying me. But in that sea of blood, black flames began to crawl beneath my skin. One of the effects of The power to steal power from the god one represents. The ether I'd taken from Varig crept into my body, burning my wounds. The ether within my arm was dense. It felt like it could burst at any moment, but I desperately kept it under wraps. Then when the axe finally descended, I met it with my fist. The sound of something getting crushed resounded. My arm was dead again, but in exchange, the giant axe was no more. Goryue. The ogre lord looked on wide-eyed, unable to believe what had just transpired. But I wasn't kind enough to wait for it to regain its senses. I immediately set off for its head. Goa. At the same time, G.I. Za struck the Ogre Lord with his wind spear, toppling the Ogre Lord onto its back. And I slammed my fists burning with ether onto the sole of its foot, to vanquish it once and for all. It seemed so strong, and yet, here it was now, on its back, blood spurting out of its mouth as a blow to its feet rendered it incapacitated. D. Damn, you, the Ogre Lord gazed at me with that muddied eye of it. My right arm was no more, but it's a small price to pay for victory. And just like that, the Ogre Lord breathed its last. We won, G.I. Za said. I nodded. Gather the living, and we'll go knock on that door. G.I. Za nodded, and he went off to check every goblin one by one. Meanwhile, I looked up the door leading to the Lord of Decay. Varid. Explain yourself. The goddess of the underworld's golden gaze was cold as frost. It seems the demonic children of chaos goblins have one. The one that I'd snake said as he looked through the evil mirror. Did I not instruct you not to lend your strength? The goddess asked. Master, you know me your faithful servant. I have not gone against your word nor sought to plot around it. Varid shook his head. Hmm. It's fine if that's the case. The goblins had won. The brilliance of the king's soul had returned, and with it, took victory by the reins. It was the result she'd wanted in the first place, but for some reason, the goddess still seemed troubled. How much did he take? A tenth, master. A tenth, only a tenth. But that was the tenth of one of the four snakes that once challenged the world. The power behind that mere tenth was nothing to scoff at. Interesting. A bewitching smile rose on the underworld goddess lips. I've been treating it a pet all this time, but. I've changed my mind. I'll grant him my blessings earnestly. As you command. At the goddess behest, the snake left the realm. And the snake thought to himself. Right now that goblin cannot control that power. But, he'll have to in the future. Otherwise, there won't be any point in receiving that power in the first place. He would support him for as long as his master ordered him to. So it would be troubling if he couldn't meet expectations. Grow stronger, little brother. Varid muttered despite knowing it would reach none. Level has risen. 7289 Author's Note Mission Success By the way, it was the goddess of the underworld who randomly gave her blessings to the ogre lord. 
Anyway, like this the path to the Lord of Decay has been opened. A mischievous goddess, a red snake, and a group of humans. It looks like the return of the king will be reaching its climax soon. Race. Ogre level. 70 class. Lord, Horde Chief Howl of Fear, Exploiter, Magic Control, Steel Skin, Possessed Skills. Protection of the Underworld Goddess, Match for a Thousand Warriors, Axe Mastery A Plus Divine Protection. Goddess of the Underworld. Attributes Darkness. Volume 1, Chapter 79. The Return of the King. You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Race. Goblin Level. 72 Class. Lord, Horde Chief BDNVL.M. Ruler of the Horde, Defiant Soul, Overpowering Howl, Swordsmanship B, Insatiable Desire, King Soul. Rulers possessed skills. Wisdom I, one that I'd snakes evil I, dance at death's border, magic manipulation, soul of a crazed warrior, third impact, the third chant, instinct, rulers wisdom two, divine protection. Goddess of the underworld attributes. Darkness, death subordinate beasts. High cobalt Hesu, LV1, Gastra, LV20, Cynthia, LV20, Orc King Bui. LV40, a giant door towered before us. Not one of us was uninjured, but fortunately, we all made it here alive. Kuzan kneeled before the door. Lord of Decay this Corrado, please hear our plea. As she began to pray on her knees, a feeling of holiness seemed to emanate from her. Who knew how much time passed before the door creaked open? Then Kuzan turned to me. Her eyes were blank, but they gleamed brightly. Please enter, my king. Just as I was about to enter the door, G.I. Za asked, Will you be fine by yourself? I'll be fine, I said as I stepped through the giant door where a darkness even my eyes could not surmise greeted me. I felt the touch of warm wind upon my skin. A nostalgic smell. That trembling voice seemed to shake everything within the darkness. So you are the Lord of Decay. I said toward the voice that could belong to no one else but the Lord of Decay himself. Are you there, Varid? He said. Strange, it's as if he wasn't trying to talk to me but to someone else. Have you forgotten how to talk? Or is there a reason you can't speak? As the voice spoke once again, I moved toward its direction. When I reached that figure obscured by the darkness, I stopped in my tracks. Rescia once spoke of a myth wherein four snakes fought alongside the goddess of the underworld for the world. One of those snakes, a twin-dot-headed snake, was right here before my very eyes. It was colossal. So big that the ogre lord I'd fought would look like an ant next to it. The door I'd entered was probably fifteen meters high, so to an extent this room must be as well. And yet the snake was big enough to make that room feel small. Its two heads lay on the ground, eyes closed, as they breathed faintly. The pressure it exuded wasn't something to scoff at, but while it certainly felt like the pressure of something that once fought the world, it's not as heavy as I expected it to be. Maybe it's because I've gotten used to the underworld goddess charm, as for some reason the ogre lord's pressure felt stronger to me. Are you getting weaker? I asked. This time, my words reached him. Varid's host, he said. Humph, quite the arrogant one, aren't we? His words echoed directly within my mind. Did you come here under Kazan's guidance? Yes. The twin dot headed snake remained unmoving as it spoke. So you are the king of the demon children of Chaos Goblins, but you know. There's an odd smell about you. The direction of the wind changed. It started blowing from behind. No, that's just the giant snake inhaling. That's a big snake all right. It's the scent of those despicable humans, he said. The humans who chased after our mother. Yes, those dirty humans. As a trace of anger gradually appeared in his voice, my dead right arm sizzled, and suddenly, it found itself back alive. The black snake varied coiled around it squirmed, and its image grew bigger. Then I felt my control over it pulling away. 
little brother, let me talk to him. When that voice fell upon my ears, the voice of the twin-dot-headed snake resounded alongside another within my mind. It's been a while, twin-headed one. Varid. Old friend. The twin-dot-headed snake's voice again changed you from anger to delight, but its actual body showed no signs of changing. I didn't expect this outcome, but I think it'd best if I just let them talk. Is mother well? Yes, beautiful as ever. Fitting of one we've sworn to. She remembers you yet. So she hasn't changed, an image flashed through my mind. A divine goddess stood before a multitude, an army of several thousands gods, yet she stood unfearing. And with a swing of her sword did she sweep away the giants and expel the magic of the elves. But we have, said the twin-dot-headed snake. The curse of the hateful god of time Juranalingers yet. It's been devouring me all this time, slowly, yet surely throughout these many moons where I've kept watch over the gate to the underworld. Twin-dot-headed one, this body is dying. It can no longer move. War is but a distant dream to me now. Varid said nothing. Nothing more needed to be said. I was right. The Lord of Decay is dying. Varid's host, I ask thee. The twin-dot-headed snake's eyes slowly opened. Two pairs, four eyes, each as white and cloudy as the other, but they looked at me directly. Wilt thou protect this gate? It was the last wish of one on the road to death. I will rule over this land as king, I said. So this I swear, to any and all who shall trespass what is mine, I will not hold back the blade of retribution. That will do, the twin-dot-headed snake said. No, you can't be. Varid said out of the blue, seemingly panicked. Varid, the twin-dot-headed snake said. Tell mother for me. Tell her I kept watch until the end. That I fulfilled my duty well. This body was cursed by the god of time. So when the next chance comes, let me watch over the gate again. Then the twin-dot-headed snake raised its heads, and it brought them next to me. When it opened its mouth, I noted its sharp jagged teeth. Every single one of theme seemed to resemble my great sword. Varid's host, I shall grant you power, he said. The power to protect this land. The power to achieve your heart's desire, his voice trembled with might. He'd seemed like ebbing ember just moments ago, yet all that seemed to be but lies now as a great pressure descended upon me. This was undoubtedly the snake that fought the world. I leave it to you, king of goblins demon children of chaos. A gust of wind blew as the twin-dot-headed snake bellowed out a cry one last time. The earth shook and the air trembled as the twin-dot-headed snake cried out for the underworld goddess herself. Then the last of the ebbing ember fizzled out, and the snake fell over and passed. Not long after, its giant body broke down into water. Friend, Varid muttered before falling into silence. He said no more as the control of my right arm returned to me. I swung it a couple of times, and it was as good as ever, as if that earlier battle was a lie. Just as I was about to leave, I felt something within my body affect my sense of direction. This feeling, the pangs of evolution buried into me. It was that ever-familiar pain of recreation, and it brought me to my knees. When she heard that voice, she knew that their family's duty to lead the tribes had ended. With a clang, the death crystal she held in her hands rolled over and fell to the ground. Master Kazan Yellow hurriedly rushed over to her, and Kazan clung to him as she cried. Father. The Lord of Decay is gone. When he heard those words, he looked toward the giant door, then he turned back to his daughter, and held her tight. Your voice. The master, the master used the last of his strength to give it back to me, with such a miraculous act occurring before him, he had no choice but to believe that the Lord of Decay had in fact passed. I see. What were the master's last words? He thanked us for serving him all this time, I see. That is more than enough recompense for our tribe. It's over, Dina. Is that my name? 
Yes, it's the name you had before you became Kazan. It's the name your mother and I chose for you. My beloved Dina. Father, the pair of father and daughter embraced each other as they cried. Watching them from a distance was Narsa who spoke to Gilmi. So the Gordab tribe would change after all. It's amazing how they can cry even though we can't. Goblins are unable to shed tears. Even when Narsa lost her own father, Jylan, not a tear fell from her eyes. It didn't matter how frustrated she was. They might be closer to elves than us. But, Narsa didn't seem to understand, but Gilmi continued. I think the fact that they were able to complete their duty is something worthy of admiration. To protect the Lord of Decay that lived in the depths of the Fortress of the Abyss. That was their duty, and a lot of time has passed since the day their ancestors first came to this land. Ganra, Gordab, Gaidga, Paradua. Perhaps even the names they inherited was all for this very day. When Narsa thought of that, a strange felling welled up from her chest. By the way, Gilmi, she said. Hmm, you promised the king the elven princess, right? What exactly were you scheming with that move? As ashamed as I am to admit it, I'd intended for it to help me negotiate with the goblins of the West. I figured it would be possible to procure one if we could just rid ourselves of the Gaidga and reach the Gordab tribe. Rashka who was listening to the side, grew interested at the conversation, and he said, does the king like elves? I was originally thinking of giving him the young women of the tribe. The king's decision to spare the children and women of his tribe bought the king much favor from them. Not to mention, they were goblins under Rashka. They naturally favored the strong, so it wasn't hard to see why the king would be popular among them. I don't understand the king's tastes. While I did promise the elf princess to him, I don't think that was the reason he helped us, Gilmi wore a delicate expression on his face, having been surprised by Raska's unexpected interest in the topic. Rashka didn't seem to care, however, and he spoke normally. I see. Well, we'll just have to gradually understand that part of the king. I did lose once to him, so it would be a mark against the tribe's honor if we can't receive the king properly. You've sure gotten talkative, haven't you, Rashka? Did the king and that shaman killing the ogre lord excite you that much? The oldest of the tribe leaders, Alyahalia, teased. He got off his mount, then as he rubbed his head, he spoke to Rashka, while Rashka promptly shut his mouth. He was certainly being talkative. But while he was normally the quiet type, there wasn't anything wrong in talking. Unfortunately, he became self-conscious like a kid when it was pointed out. He wanted to get mad, but that was even more childish, so Raska put a lid on his mouth instead. After a while, he thought he'd finally say something back, but then the voice of G.I. Za, the shaman of the eastern village, suddenly called out. King. As soon as he turned around, he fell to his knees. He was shocked. But when he looked around him, he found that everyone was the same. They were all kneeling as they greeted the king. When he glanced up to the king for a moment, he felt that dignity that made him kneel. He was now much taller, being only a head smaller than Rashka. A lone horn like that of a unicorn extended from his head toward the heavens, and beside it were two crooked horns like those of a minotaur. His two red eyes that looked down on everything had vertical pupils just like those of a snake. His muscles were perfectly toned. It was as if all the unnecessary parts were taken away, leaving behind only the toned muscles of a great warrior. His skin was generally black, but there was an image coiled around his right arm like a tattoo that was even blacker than his skin. There was something similar on his left arm, a purple something that looked just like a jewel. As the king walked, his tail swung to help keep his balance. I have something to announce, the king said. For long fangs like those of a dog's could be seen when the king opened his mouth. But more than that the voice that left his lips greatly shook the hearts of the goblins. Even Rashka was amazed. I will gather our brethren here. At those words, a chill crawled up Rashka's back. He knew it was rude, but he still looked up the king. There was a dignity and majesty to the king's face he didn't recall. 
I will build our kingdom upon this land. Drops of sweat began to form within Rashka's hand as he gripped it tight. And his two legs that were placed firmly onto the land felt eager to shake. So, this is the king. The king that would lead us. Joy like fire shook his whole body. When he looked around him, he saw that the other goblins were the same. The king has returned. From a legend of long ago, through a period of unknown time, the king had finally returned. Chiefs of the tribes, let every goblin know. I have returned. A voice squeezed out from the depths of his belly. How could one explain this joy to another? For in this moment, the king that would lead the tribes, the king that would lead the goblins had at long last returned. Because your level has risen past 100, your class will now promote from lord to king. You have received the protection of the master of the fortress of the abyss, the lord of decay. You have received the blessing of the underworld goddess follower, Varid. You have received the blessing of the goddess of the underworld. Your status will now be overhauled. Volume 2, Intermission Attack I You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Name G.I. De Race Goblin Level 34 Class Rare Possessed Skills Swordsmanship C, Overpowering Howl, Omnivorous, A Monster's Feelings, Beast Tamer, Instinct Divine Protection None Attributes None The Sun Shone From High Above The Sky G.I.G.A. was practicing hard today too. Though he has gotten much better now, as he rarely falls off, and can even properly direct the rider.beast to go where he wants. Even though one of his legs is fake, he can somehow straddle the rider.beast and even swing his spear, albeit somewhat weaker than when on foot. With the reins of the beast on one hand and a spear on the other, G.I.G.A. rode through the forests on the back of the black tiger known as Haku. Found you. Prowling the forest in search of a prey, G.I.G.A. set his sights on a lone double dot head. He pulled on the reins as he lightly kicked the black tiger, and as the black tiger's instincts woke, they bolted through the forest. The double dot head caught wind of their charge, and it ran for its life. It knew its place as the prey. There was no winning against one's predator, so it ran without a second thought. Passing through the trees, the double dot head ran for its life despite the hard rocky road. But the black tiger was no greenhorn to hunting, and neither was the goblin on its back. They were both veterans of the hunt, and they caught up in no time. G.I.G.A. stretched out his long arm and attacked the double dot head, slowing it down, giving chance for the black tiger to finish it off. Like that the short game of cat and mouse came to an end. You've already mastered riding Haku, I see. The Paragua goblin who came here as a messenger, Alashed, nodded in satisfaction. Only because of your excellent teaching, Lord Alashed. G.I.G.A. gratefully said as he sheathed his spear into the saddle's sheath. If you're this good now, then I think I'll be able to return at ease. When will you be departing? Tomorrow Eve. It won't take five days with the black tiger's strong legs, but it would still be best to leave soon. The days will be lonely, Lord Alashed. At the very least, let us see you off with a feast. G.I.G.A. pointed to the double dot head he'd just hunted. Then I'd like some of those dried meat of yours. They're quite delicious. It'll be my pleasure. Alashed fastened the double dot head to his mount and the two of them rode side dot by dot side back to the G.I. village. The beast tamer, G.I. De, was growing anxious as the kobolds haven't contacted them since yesterday. What's the matter? The water mage, G.I. Zo, asked upon noticing G.I. De's unusual behavior. G.I. Zo excelled at water magic even among the druids of G.I. Za's village, so G.I. Za and the king expected much from him. G.I.G.A. Rax and G.I. Zo were the two goblins in charge of the G.I. village, so when G.I. Zo inquired for the source of G.I. De's unrest, he readily reported the lack of contact with the kobolds. No contact with kobold. Anxious, me. Even the king's very own subordinate beast who would pester them for food hadn't shown itself in the past two days. 
have they found a way to procure food themselves? It was hard to believe that that gluttonous kobold would just up and go. Something bad must have happened, G.I. De thought, and his grim countenance grew even grimmer. Me, worried. I'll, look. Very well. I shall consult with Lord G.I.G.A. on my end. Thank you. G.I. Zo knew that the kobold's eyes that the king left was a crucial line of defense against the orcs and the humans. The orcs have been behaving all this time but it was best to be safe. G.I. De himself did not understand this, but he knew instinctively that the kobold's lack of contact was not a good thing. And so, he headed east with his triple bore. Meanwhile, G.I. Zo himself became thoughtful. Have the orcs rebelled? Rather than a human invasion, the first thing to come to mind was an orc rebellion. After all, they were enemies just not long ago. The short time spent in peace was not enough to wash away the memories of G.O.L. G.O.L.'s raid. Why the sour face? Did something happen? The goblin that was almost like a disciple to G.I.G.A., G.I. Da, asked when he noted G.I. Zo's sour countenance. Actually, G.I. Da scratched his head when he heard G.I. Zo's story. I see where you're coming from, but I can't imagine those orcs rebelling. Though they might once they've gotten strong enough, he added. Regardless, please send word for the normal goblins to gather at the village. We have plenty of food stockpiled, so it should be fine to halt our hunts and focus on keeping watch until the kobolds bring word. After G.I. De bowed, G.I. Zo went to the king's house. He had to explain the situation to the king's treasures, the humans. G.I.G.A. was the one truly in charge of the village, but he was out. So, the responsibility would then fall to G.I. Zo's shoulders. I hope nothing bad happens. As a foreboding chill touched upon him, he looked grimly to the eastern sky. With the triple bore at the lead, Giida traveled to the kobold's village with his subordinates and their wild dogs. Half the day passed until he finally neared the kobold's village, and the uneasiness he felt stirred even stronger. Then the triple bore and the wild dog started growling. Is, someone, there? G.I. De walked as cautiously as he could while the dogs were set loose to all four directions. Then when one of the wild dogs found something and started growling, one of G.I. De's subordinates, a normal goblin, shushed the dog as he took a peek at the dog's discovery. He then ran up to G.I. De with a look of shock on his face. What, happened? Humans, came, lots of humans. G.I. De passed by the shaking goblin to confirm his findings through the thickets. And when he did, he could not believe his eyes. What in, the world, crowds of men dressed in armor cut the trees and dug the ground, whittling the forest in their path. G.I. De did not not understand why these men were here. What he did know was that these men came here to destroy their land. But fighting now was a fool's errand. There were far too many of them. In fact, they outnumbered even the orcs. We, must inform, Lord G.I.G.A., G.I. De turned on his heels as he grit his teeth. Going so soon. But then a voice fell upon his ears. A cold voice unfit for the situation at hand, which brought G.I. De an unprecedented sense of crisis. The owner of that voice appeared before him. Gotta hand it over to Golan. That ruckus really did attract some prey. Just kill them already, and let's have a feast. All this anger I have pent up need to go somewhere after all. These guys can take the place of those blasted orcs. Three adventurers approached him with the wand of destruction, Belen, in tow. G U R U U R U R U, one of the adventurers became thoughtful at Gida's growls. This thing is a horde chief. Sure is rare to see a beast tamer lead one, one of the adventurers said. Well, there are a lot of odd ones lately. From kobolds to orcs, so it's not really that weird anymore, another adventurer said. Who cares, just kill him already. If you don't hurry up, the other teams will get the points, insisted the third of the bunch. That's true, the other adventurers nodded. Then the three of them prepared to face Giida. 
G.I. de himself was only a rare goblin, but he had no intention of losing to either the water mage, G.I. Zo, or the spearman, G.I. de. Those who hunted frequently develop a sort of sixth sense. A sense that allowed G.I. de to see the difference in strength between him and his foe. No, to be more precise, he couldn't help but see that difference. For his instincts as a beast screamed at him from within. He couldn't win. This was the indisputable difference between the hunted and the hunter, the predator and the prey. Which is also why G.I. de himself hadn't attacked and the three adventurers were casually talking among themselves. There was no other choice. Well that's how it is. Don't take it personally. The Wand of Destruction, Belen who hadn't spoken a word until now, violently declared. Scatter. When the Wand of Destruction, Belen, stepped out, G.I. de charged toward him with his triple bore. New, T.C.H. When the triple bore hit Belen, he charged out again toward another adventurer. The rest of the goblins used this opportunity to run back to the village. Cheeky bastards. You're not going anywhere. The other two adventurers chased after the normal goblins, but the goblins were much faster when moving through the forest. Magic came shooting at them from behind, and one died, but the rest of them were able to safely escape. So you used yourself as a decoy to let the others go. Belen had sent G.I. to flying after he charged into him. And when he saw the goblins running away, he looked at him with a murderous gaze. G.U.R.U.U.U., a respectable plan for a goblin, but it's meaningless. The triple boar was already dead. Dot, send word to Hawk, I. Something along the lines of, attack the goblin's village, dot. The remaining adventurer took out a gem, and started talking, while G.I. de readied himself for a fight. Your opponent is me. A red light shone from Belen's wand. From fire shall be born a blade, fire sword, a fire erupted from the red gem embedded at the edge of Belen's wand, it shaped itself into the figure of a sword. With the fire blade extending from the wand, Belen's weapon had essentially changed into a naginata. As he gripped his naginata tight, he fiercely yelled. Taste the power of the wand of destruction. As Belen spun his naginata above his head, it struck out at a terrifying speed toward G.I. De. G.I. De already knew he couldn't win against this opponent, so he sought to buy time instead. G.I. De jumped back. As he crashed into the ground, the edge of Belen's burning naginata met him. Naive. Fire reached out from the ground G.I. Gook crashed into, and it changed into the form of a sword. G.I. De twisted his body, but one of his arms was still completely burned. G.U.G.O.U.A. G.I. De screamed out in pain, while Belen pursued him, and hit him again with the butt of his naginata. G.I. De somehow managed to pick himself back up, but one of his arms was no more. He had to fight one-handed with his sword against Belen. I've sent word. Should I help? No. Help has no place in a knight's battle. Right. The adventurer shrugged, but Belen didn't even glance at him. Although no longer a knight, Belen still considered fights to be a sacred ceremony. A ceremony wherein two warriors fought with everything they had to take everything from each other. If you're not coming, then I will. After confirming G.I. De's position, Belen nimbly moved. With a step, he struck out his flaming naginata. G.I. De tried to slip under that attack, but the blade of fire struck him from the back. As G.I. De writhed in pain, Belen prepared to give the finishing strike. G.U.R.U.U.A. Knew, at that moment, G.I. De wrung out the last of his strength to gamble one last time. He would throw his body to tackle Belen, as the latter tried to land the finishing blow. The Naginata on its descent, G.I. De moved his feet, he bent his body, to make way for that last gamble, a literal race against time, but. Looks like, I was a moment slower. The burning Naginata was faster. G.I. De's body was split in half. Hmm, is something wrong? The adventurer watching the battle asked when he saw Belen's thoughtful face. No. It seems this goblin wasn't the boss of this area. Goblin rares are more than enough for a leader around these parts. 
then it doesn't make sense. Why did he let the other goblins leave? Well, that's, if he is the boss, then he would have prioritized protecting himself. He would have done so even if it meant using the other goblins as shields. That is how the leader of a horde is. He would rather protect himself than appoint another to lead or let the rest escape to save the most. To a horde's leader, his life is his most prized treasure. So you're saying there's someone even bigger than this guy? That's impossible. No way there's gonna be a noble. Or duke dot class out here in the boundary. As the adventurer said that, the other two adventurers returned. Fuck. They got away. We've mostly figured out where they're headed, so if we go now, we'll reach them before the others. Let's go then, after regrouping with the other two adventurers, Belen entered deep into the forest. In his eyes burned the desire to fight an even stronger foe. Note. 1. Beast Warrior. Beast Tamer. This won't change again, since the author provided a reading. Maybe there was one provided from the start, but it wasn't in my notes. Anyway. Volume 2, Intermission. Ancient Beast Tamer you are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Name. G.I.G.I. Race. Goblin Level. 95 Class. Rare Possessed Skills. Tracking, Throw Projectile, Axe Mastery D+, Omnivorous, Jeer, A Monster's Feelings, Beast Tamer Divine Protection. None Attributes. None Subordinate Beasts. 2.Headed, Ostrich Double Head There is Love in Discipline. G.I.G.I. who always rode on his beloved steed always believed that. In fact, he believed it ever since they captured G.I. Gu's village, back when the king was only a noble class. But that belief grew even more fervent when he saw how the Paragua goblins lived. The Paragua goblins truly lived as one with their black tigers. A Paragua goblin could say, A, and the black tiger would finish with, Hum. The Paragua goblins were truly in sync with their beasts. So one must be in harmony with his beast. His dear friend, the stealthy G.I.G., nodded. G.I.G.I. looked at his beloved steed. Though they could not talk with words, their feelings should come across as long as they have love. G.I.G.I. tried to talk to his beloved steed with his eyes. A. G.I.G.I. tried saying, but his beloved steed only tilted its heads. For eyes blankly looked at G.I.G.I., but he wasn't about to give up. His love was not enough. That's all there was to it. A. He tried shouting again, and the two-dot-headed ostrich double-head inclined its heads even stronger. G.I.G.I. started to worry that the doubly head might tumble over if they kept this up. What was he doing wrong? G.I.G.I. wondered. A dot hum, G.G.I. muttered. I see, so that's how to harmonize. Then he shook his head. What's the point in a hum dot ing alone? Both G.I.G.I. and the doublehead tilted their heads in confusion. Then, for some reason, the doublehead happily cried as it wrapped its two heads around G.I.G.I.'s neck. You get, along well. That's good. G.I.G. said, having misunderstood the situation. Of course. G.I.G.I. happily exclaimed as he started to feel the same. Let's hunt. He suddenly said as he rode on his double head, who happily cried in response. Onward. And they set off with G.I.G. running alongside them. The king had just conquered the fortress of the abyss, and was busy with the tribe chiefs. In fact, he hadn't been seen during this rare moment of peace since he defeated the ogres and the ogre lord. It was the perfect opportunity to tour the area. The ecosystem in the forests near the tribe's villages was completely different from the eastern village. The old adage, monsters grow stronger as one heads west, has certainly proved itself true. Naturally, the monsters to be hunted also grew stronger. The prey G.I.G.I. and G.I.G. set their eyes on was the green caterpillar giant caterpillar known for its hard skin even among the monsters of this area and its ability to spit mucus. 
the giant caterpillars could be as big as an adult goblin when fully grown or small enough to crawl on one's hands when still young. Doubleheads love to feast on baby green caterpillars. They would frequently stick their head into the ground or into fallen trees to look for baby green caterpillars to eat. As larvae, the green caterpillars' skin were still soft. Biting into one would release this irresistibly, delicious juice that's to die for. The older ones are much bigger. Goblins can't even eat them unless they cut them up first, but they are also delicious. In fact, when the king set off for the tribes, they hunted one along the way. It was chewy and delicious. G.I.G.I., G.I.G., -G -I -G, and the doublehead spent all day looking for green caterpillars from fallen trees. Found one. And another one. G.G.I. said. There's one here. G.I.G. said. When G.I.G.I. would speak, G.I.G. would also speak. But then without even so much as a cry, the double head went up to G.I.G.I. and ate a green caterpillar from his hands. What are you doing? G.I.G.I. asked. The double head feigned ignorance as one of its heads ate the caterpillar in front of G.I.G.I., while the other started eating caterpillar after caterpillar out of the opening in the fallen tree. Mumumu, G.I.G.I. growled as he looked for other green caterpillars. We made a killing today. G.I.G. happily exclaimed as he threw the green caterpillar he found over to G.I.G.I., who nodded as he munched on one of the baby green caterpillars. Meanwhile, the double head that had started feasting through the opening in one of the fallen trees suddenly found itself unable to pull its head out when it stuck its other head in two. It started to desperately flap its wings. Aren't you going to help him? G.I.G. asked. He did that to himself. G.I.G.I. curtly replied. Gyu. Gyu, the double head cried. The two goblins who were happily feasting on the trove of green caterpillars lost themselves in the moment, and they failed to notice the approaching threat. A truly foolish mistake for a rare goblin. Jiokeyuyuoryu angrily cried something behind them. When they turned, what greeted them were ten giant caterpillars. In his shock, G.I.G.I. lost his grip on the baby caterpillar, and then he looked at G.I.G., who looked at him in turn. They both drew cold sweat as they stood there frozen stiff. Meanwhile, a certain double head was still flapping its wings. The two goblins tacitly came to an understanding. They gradually retreated as the large number of giant caterpillars slithered toward them. Then when they finally neared a certain double head whose head was yet stuck in some fallen tree, they turned around, and made a run for it. Amen. Sorry, it's the law of the jungle. You know how it is. Gyu. Despite looking so glum, the two goblins ran foolishly with their tail between their legs. They passed by the double head, as they bolted off with all their strength. The double head panicked. You actually left me behind. In a fit of anger, the double head found its heads free. By all means, the right course of action was to shake the giant caterpillars off. But the double head wouldn't be satisfied with just that. No. It had to at least make those two goblins suffer too. So it ran through the forest with the caterpillars in tow. As one might expect, an army of giant caterpillars had no say against two rare class goblins and a furious two dot headed ostrich double head in a game of cat and mice, but they weren't about to take having their home destroyed lying down either. The army of caterpillars formed a line as they continued to pursue the double head through the forest. Giant caterpillars did not excel at running, but they had long lost their minds to anger, and they wrung out every bit of strength they could as they sought to punish their unjust invaders. Unfortunately, reality was cruel, and the caterpillars who weren't even good at running started to find themselves running out of steam. But then the double head who was right ahead of them suddenly cried out. The caterpillars and the double head did not share a common language. It's those pesky goblins. But they understood each other all the same. And with that, the will of the caterpillars unified. The enemy is near. We've caught up to the goblins. Though rotten, the double head was after all a double head, 
and its speed was not something the caterpillars could match. But just as they were on the verge of giving up, the double head cried out. You can do it, it seemed to say. One of the double head's head was talking to them as it ran. Gyu, it cried. He's such a good person, the caterpillars thought. As the double head gallantly cried out, they passed through the break of the forest. Then like a knight charging toward its enemy, the double head jumped. Gyu, it cried. Onward. The army of caterpillars wrung out the last of their strength. They would give the highest of merits to the double head once they caught those pesky goblins, then the scenery of the open forest unfolded before them. The double head had seen through a hole in tree that G.I.G. managed to pick up the caterpillar that G.I.G.I. dropped. And he certainly had it in his hands when they left him there when they ran. I want to eat it. Right. Once they get caught by the caterpillars, they won't be able to eat that last piece anymore. That last piece was his. When the double head turned around, the adult caterpillars were right behind him. Can't eat those. P.E. Gyu. The two heads didn't realize the contradiction in his thoughts. Like that they passed through the break in the forest. Nav O.M. found them. Gyu. Joy filled the double head when he noticed that the baby caterpillar was still in that goblin rare's hands. Oh, you came back. For some reason, the goblin was happily caressing his wings, but the double head ignored him and went for the caterpillar. They followed him. Let's do this. The goblin took the caterpillar and threw it toward the forest. No, the worm. Gee. The double head caught the caterpillar in midair. A spectacular technique even he had to admire. But there were caterpillars below him. You're in the way. When the army of caterpillars left the forest into the open fields, what attacked them was none other than the very same double head that led their chase. It landed right on top of the leading caterpillar. As its great weight trampled one of the caterpillars, it sent another flying as it started to run. But why? The caterpillars were confused. Why would the double head attack them all of the sudden? But then one of them saw the baby caterpillar in its mouth. Have we been betrayed? Q yo 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 yo. Even the wails of the caterpillar was drowned out by the double head's mad charge. The caterpillars were spent after running through the forest. They could only watch as the crazy bird sent them flying left and right. Then finally, the two goblins that had supposedly run away appeared. Good, job, dot. You're quite the devil too, huh? To the powerless caterpillars who'd been turned over to their bellies, the two goblins were no different from a pair of demons. There sure are a lot of giant caterpillars today, I pointed out as I ate supper in the fortress of the abyss. Lord G.I.G.I. and Lord G.I.G. managed to catch an army of them today, Kazan said. Didn't I tell them that the four tribes will take care of the hunts? Or did they still want to hunt despite that? Hmm. Anyway, greed isn't bad for growing stronger. It won't be long. According to the one that I'd snake's evil eye, the both of them would soon promote a class. Won't be long for what? Kazan asked. It's nothing, I wryly smiled. Come, let us eat. The next day, I received word that G.I.G.I. and his subordinate beast promoted a class. Name. G.I.G.I. Race. Goblin Level. One class. Noble Possessed Skills. Tracking, Throw Projectile, Axe Mastery D+, Omnivorous, Jeer, Beast Tamer, Tacit Understanding, Ancient Beast Tamer, Beast Trainer, Cooperation, Friend of the Horde, Bug Eater Divine Protection. None attributes. None subordinate beasts. 2.Headed Ostrich Double Head Author's Note. G.I.G. Boss, you're so evil, G.I.G.I. Not as bad as you, your majesty. G.I.G. and G.I.G.I. Bwahaha. These sort of conversations may or may not have happened. Anyway, until next time. Volume 2, Intermission.
Attack 2 You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Name. G.I. Zo Race. Goblin Level. 19 Class. Druid Possessed Skills. Magic Manipulation, Water Manipulation, Inspire Divine Protection. God of Water Iron Attributes. Water G.I. Des subordinates returned in haste and reported to the Water Mage, G.I. Zo. Humans are attacking. G.I. Zo did not know much about humans. The most he knew about them were the king's treasures, Rescia and Lily. Then there was Mattis who would prepare dried meat for them and the humans who would repair the fences. The humans killed G.I. Da. The reporting goblin shivered in fright when he saw the usually calm G.I. Zo turn furious. The goblin continued to shake as he reported that G.I. Zo sacrificed himself to let them go. By the end of the report, G.I. Zo was shaking in fury. It doesn't matter who it is. If they bear their fangs against us, then we shall cut them down. He needed to inform the spearman, G.I. Da, too. So he ordered the goblin to send word. As for him, he had to pay a visit to the king's treasure, Lady Rescia. There would probably be some unrest from the humans because of who they were fighting. He hoped Rescia and Lily could help quell that unrest. This particularity of his to be concerned about others' feelings is one of the things the king and G.I. Za held in esteem. Unfortunately, they were the only ones who thought so. To the goblins, power is everything. Things like concern or empathy, which have no effect on one's social standing in the horde couldn't be any less relevant. And it would be so until the king solidifies his position as the rightful ruler of the horde. G.I. Zo himself did not see his power as greater than his peers, though he did find himself lacking from time to time. Because of that he felt the weight of his duty as the caretaker of the village. Lady Rescia, Lord Lily, it's G.I. Zo, G.I. Zo knocked, and the ladies granted him permission to enter. G.I. Zo's respectful attitude to the king's treasure was also born from his sense of responsibility. As he entered the crude yet orderly house of the king, he began to explain the situation. He held down the fury brimming within from the death of G.I. Da as he calmly reported to the king's treasure. Afterwards, he asked them to help calm the humans. Very well. I shall do as you ask, Rescia said. Letting out a breath of relief, G.I. Zo left the house. In his eyes burnt the fire of wrath born from the loss of his brethren. Lord G.I. Zo, the spearman, G.I. Da, had his spear over his shoulder as he called out to him. Has Lord G.I. G.A. returned? G.I. Zo asked, to which G.I. Da shook his head. Then there's no other choice. We will have to overcome this danger ourselves. Lord G.I. Da, I leave the village to you. I shall scatter the humans. G.I. Da's eyes opened wide upon hearing those words. No. I, should go. Lord G.I. Za, is the village chief. I go. His burning heart seemed to fan his feelings, and he stamped his feet and even hit the ground with the butt of his spear. Not quite, Lord G.I. Da. It is Lord G.I. G.A. who is in charge of the village. I am merely a representative, but it is my duty to protect the village. G.I. Da eventually understood after it was repeatedly explained to him. The difference in intelligence between a normal goblin and a druid was big. Fortunately, G.I. Zo was able to convince G.I. Da to let him go. I will take those I can. Though my heart isn't steady, I leave the village to you, Lord G.I. Da. Leave it, to me. I, protect village. The males of the goblins that could fight numbered 90. But that number included the injured and the greenhorns. The goblins could reproduce incessantly, so it came as no surprise that they have already caught up to their old numbers before the Orc War. G.I. Zo took with him only a third of the goblins, but each and every one of them was the cream of the crop, every one of them a hardened veteran. The horde of goblins headed east. The female adventurer known as the White Hand of Life was, as the name implied, dressed in a gaudy, white robe from head to toe. It's over. It's over I tell you. 
The elderly dot looking adventurer clicked his hand when he saw the scene before him. Dot, it's all right, it's all right. Everything is going to be fine. The white hand of life was as optimistic as ever. It was probably because of his taciturn personality that the other adventurer quietly held his shield up despite looking like he was about to curse any moment now. A horde of goblins was before them. After Gullen's group that consisted mostly of adventurers destroyed an orc village, they went deeper into the forest to search for the saint while having fun hunting monsters. Thinking about it logically, the orcs were probably at the top of the food chain here. There were a lot of them, but after Gullen attacked them, they immediately ran away. If those orcs were at the top, then it should stand to reason that the level of the monsters around weren't much, so Gullen split his group into three. Would it have been better to go with the boss? Or maybe with the Wand of Destruction? The elderly dot looking adventurer quietly asked to no one in particular. The White Hand of Life wasn't happy with his mumblings, and she filled the wand in her hand with magic power. The Divine God would rather you do your job than complain, she said. Right, right. I probably should start currying favor with God now, eh? While the elderly dot looking adventurer kept yapping, the taciturn adventurer nodded. Unyielding shield shield rush. He struck out his shield against the oncoming horde of goblins to open a path. The goblins went flying, and a small path opened up for them, allowing them to slip away from being surrounded. The taciturn adventurer was the very example of a heavy knight. But the difference in number was just too great, and the goblins kept trying to find their way around their backs. Sorry, but I can't let you gobs dig a hole out of that one. Wind slash. The elderly dot looking adventurer slashed at the goblins with his long sword. It moved faster than the wind, leaving no opening for the goblins to take. This was the power of the light soldiers, the power of speed. The small band of adventurers worked together to escape from the goblin surround. The divine god is great confusion. Magic power emanated from the wand of the white hand of life, wrapping itself around the area and oscillating. The oscillating magic brought confusion to the goblins, causing them to slow down as they lost sight of their enemy. Just what you'd expect from the beloved priest of God. The elderly. Looking adventurer struck his sword against the yet sane goblins. Just hurry up and get out of their surround. The white hand of healing said as she tried to keep herself from showing her impatience while they slipped through the confused goblins. Hurry. The taciturn adventurer said. But just as they were about to get free. Water bullet. Ugh. A groan of pain sounded from one of them. Standing before them was a seemingly smart, red goblin, with a staff in one hand. It gave off the sort of dignity one would expect from a boss monster. Oh, come on. A druid. The elderly dot looking adventurer muttered, to which the taciturn adventurer nodded. Pull yourselves together. Remember your master. The druid's words woke the goblins from their stupor, and they fixed their grip on their clubs and stakes as they once again approached the three adventurers. Just fight as you normally do. Don't cower. At the goblin druid's words, the goblins all attacked. TCH. The taciturn adventurer clicked his tongue. Two goblins took his flanks. At the same time, a club came swinging at him from in front, leaving him no choice but to jump back. Damn it. The elderly dot looking adventurer cursed. He had struck his sword against one of the goblins, but it was able to receive his blow. Then while he was still open, another goblin aimed for his legs, breaking his balance and leaving him open to what would have been a fatal attack if he hadn't somehow blocked it. The sparks erupting from his sword and the goblin's club made him draw a cold sweat. The goblin that had stopped his blow a while ago, struck out its sharpened stake, passing right in front of him. He jumped back to make some distance, but behind him was the taciturn adventurer. They crashed into each other. GG. A goblin cried. An attack came swinging at them, and the elderly dot looking adventurer hurriedly used his sword as a shield. Ark. The elderly dot looking adventurer cried out in pain. 
one of the goblins had aimed for his legs. Just one would have been manageable, but then another three attacked him at the same time. The goblins fought together well. Too well, in fact, and before he knew it, his clothes were drenched in sweat. TCH, he swept with his long sword against goblins. This is bad. The goblins were better at working together than he'd thought. Who would have thought there could be someone other than the elves or the demi-humans of the main continent who could fight together this well? The attack he'd received earlier to his feet was fatal. His life wasn't in danger just yet, but he could no longer run from the goblins. The taciturn adventurer didn't look so swell himself either. His shield was stuck on the ground, and his hands seemed to have been done in, as he was desperately trying to stop the bleeding. Running wasn't an option. But then defeating all the goblins was even harder. In that case, there was only one option left. They would have to defeat the chief of the horde. Unfortunately, that was a far-fetched dream as the wall of normal goblins kept them a good distance away from the druid. As the divine god wills heal. Suddenly, the pain vanished. And the two adventurers found themselves brimming with power. When they turned to the voice that spoke that chant, they found the white hand of life surrounded by something they could not make out. The divine god has not abandoned us yet. Please do your best, she said. It was only through the slight opening of her robes, but the elderly. Looking adventurer was sure that she smiled just then. TCH, I don't know about God or whatever, but it sure as hell feels like you're just taking advantage of us, sitting there at the back without risking your life. Oi, quiet guy. Can you fight? The elderly. Looking adventurer asked. Of course, the taciturn adventurer quietly replied as he took out a hatchet from his great shield. As the adventurers and the goblins stared daggers at each other, the curtains upon the dance of death between man and goblin were drawn. Volume 2, Intermission Attack 3 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Name G.I. Zo Race Goblin Level 19 Class Druid possessed skills. Magic manipulation, water manipulation, inspire divine protection. God of water iron attributes. Water the water magician, G.I. Zo, shot his water bullet toward the adventurer, who blocked with his shield. G.I. Zo could not shoot him down, but his relentless barrage of water bullets left the adventurer with no other choice but to keep defending. It was a barrage of power and accuracy. Yet G.I. Zo's countenance remained grim. The reason was the healer behind the two adventurers. As the divine god wills heal. That irritating white light wrapped itself around the two adventurers, and all of the sudden, they were back to health. The tank with exceedingly high defense. The attacker who would cut to pieces the normal goblins. But the most annoying of them all was the healer, who not only defended but also restored their strength. That seemingly endless magic power allowed them to gradually whittle away at the goblins' numbers. They could heal as much they wished, recovering their wounds and strength, while the goblins could only incur more and more damage. Even then, Giezo had no choice but to try and endure. But. The divine god is great confusion. Water bullet. If they let up even a little, the healer would cast a spell of confusion to try and break whatever advantage they had from their number. G.I. Zo tried to aim for her, but the taciturn adventurer stopped him with his shield. Ku, G.I. Zo clicked his tongue out of frustration. They couldn't win like this. He needed to remain calm and think of a way to win. Five of the thirty goblins were already down for the count. They had to think of a way to reduce the enemy's numbers. If not that, then at least a way to stop them. Suddenly, the goddess of wisdom Hera smiled upon him, ready the stones. G.I. Zo ordered, and a group of three goblins began picking up stones. The target is the human at the back. G.I. Zo ordered the normal goblins to aim for the healer. Damn it. They've figured us out. The elderly dot looking adventurer, the attacker of the group, used his body to protect the white hand of life. 
G.I. Zhou smiled devilishly when he saw that. You know your target. Keep throwing those rocks. The rock.throwing squad sealed the white hand of life's movements. G.I. Zhou ordered the goblins not to attack the sword. Wielding adventurer, so as to force the shield.bearing adventurer into defending himself. As long as the rocks kept coming, the sword.wielding adventurer could be kept away from the shield.bearing one, and the sword. Wielding one won't be able to attack the normal goblins either. But what was most crucial of all was the healer, for she was the human's lifeline. As the divine god wills heal. The heal came earlier this time. That was proof that the human's shield won't last long. Victory is at hand. At last, we shall avenge Jiida. The goblin's spirit rose. This is bad. This is really bad. The elderly dot looking adventurer grit his teeth as he fended off the flying stones. Who would have thought there was a goblin who could think this well? Not only were they able to fight well together, they even thought up a plan to seal their movements. They were so good, they could pass for adventurers themselves. When the elderly dot looking adventurer turned to his back, he saw the white hand of life breathing roughly as she grit her teeth. As the divine god wills heal. Healing for the umpteenth time, the taciturn adventurer's armor no longer resembled its former image as the goblin's attacks bore into them one after another. At this rate, they would all be annihilated. When the elderly dot looking adventurer thought of having even the taciturn adventurer's body hair plucked out, he couldn't help but laugh, though he did so forcefully. Since it's come to this, we should, he was about to say when a voice came from behind. I'll open a path, the white hand of life said. When they turned around to her, they saw her breathing heavily. She looked at them as they looked at her, and for the first time, they saw her face. She was beautiful. You have a plan, yes. Of course. This, 8, TCH. As the divine god wills heal. The goblins swarmed their tank, so she had to forcefully cast heal to help him fight off the goblins. We don't have time to talk. Just say what you need. We'll break through and retreat. You go first, then me, and then you, Vitz. The elderly dot looking adventurer, Vitz, did not think she would actually remember their names. For a moment, he looked at her, wide dot eyed. A high dot ranking adventurer, the white hand of life herself, actually remembered their name. Questions. N. None, he could risk his life if it's for a beautiful woman, he convinced himself. Yugal will watch the rear, while you take his place to fight off the goblins. After that leave the rest to me, the white hand of life said. Okay. He replied. Yugal, we're switching. The taciturn shield.bearing adventurer, Yugal, seemed surprised for a moment, but he quickly regained himself, and ran from the goblins. They tried to chase after him, but Vitz took Yugal's place, keeping them from pursuing any further. Wind slash. The wind slashed toward the goblins, but they were able to defend. At most, a goblin or two were hurt, but that was fine. He only needed to buy time. You should be looking over here. Vitz said as a goblin tried to pass by his flank. Using all of his strength, he blew the goblin away. Water bullet. False abandonment parry. The flat side of his sword scooped up the water bullet, and like that he changed its trajectory. Magic won't work on me. Now, who else wants some? Vitz smiled. When the goblins saw him easily flick away the goblin druid's strongest spell, they all faltered for a moment. What they didn't know was that Vitz had gambled just now. That earlier parry only went well by luck. It was not something he could repeat so easily, as the odds of success weren't that high. It was a 50.50 gamble, but since he won, he was going to squeeze it for all it's worth. Vitz, fall back. The white hand of life said. When Vitz heard that, he bolted for it. After him. The irritated voice of goblins could be heard behind, but there was no hesitation in him. He ran as fast as he could. 
G.I. Zhou regretted his decision when he saw the adventurer running away so quickly. The technique just now was nothing more than a bluff. He shouldn't be able to repeat it much. So he decided to chase after him, but then light suddenly filled his vision. The light of God will show the way, light. When the words of a human fell upon his ears, a light that could scorch his eyes filled the area, and for a moment, he found himself unable to move. By the time he regained his sight, the humans were no more. After them. Absolutely do not let them go. He could immediately tell that the humans had run. There were marks on the grass and the smell of the humans lingered yet. Bring back the injured. If Lord G.I.G.A. returns, report to him the situation. With the injured gone, there were only twenty of them left. G.I. Zo took those twenty to chase after the humans. As they continued, the smell of humans grew stronger. It was not the smell of G.I. Dis murderers, however. But that was all the more reason that he could not let them go. According to the report of G.I. Dis subordinates, the number of humans is staggering. A number too great to count. Just three of them were already that strong. If they don't whittle down the enemy's numbers, the village will surely fall. He wasn't certain if even the king himself could deal with that many humans, so he had to put a stop to them here. Onward. Slay the humans. The goblins ran faster at G.I. Zo's words. Goblins originally ran faster than humans in the forest, for they could move as they pleased. It didn't take long before the figure of a human appeared before them. Immediately, G.I. Zo fired off his water bullet. Water bullet that the human was able to dodge by bending his body, but he still ended up being delayed. Surround him. G.I. Zo ordered the goblins onward, and they encircled the humans. The humans had their backs to each other, but leaving no chance to fate, G.I. Zo had the stone duck throwing squad start throwing stones. There was no need to hurry. If they slowly whittle down the enemy, they can finish them off once they run out of gas. As he stifled the anger seething within, G.I. Zo calmly commanded the goblins. He fended off the falling stones despite being irritated. You sure it's here? Vitz asked. Yes, I'm positive, the white hand of life replied. The three of them fended off the falling stones. They had led the goblins here according to the plan of the wild hand of life, but Vitz failed to see how this was any better. If anything, it would be more apt to say that they were in a worse situation now than before, since this time they were actually surrounded. Don't worry, the white hand of life said. He couldn't get mad at her. The one who decided to gamble was him. He was not forced to this, so he didn't have the right to get mad just because the plan didn't work. Gradually, more and more rocks came flying at them. Some were straight balls and some were curved, the goblins were a truly, tricky bunch. In the midst of that seemingly endless rain of stones, one grazed past his legs, taking his attention away. It was for a moment, only a moment, but it was in that moment that a stone came falling right over his head. TCH, his mind a bit hazy, he tried to stand up, but stone after stone were already headed his way. There was even a water bullet mixed in with that barrage. Yugal's shield had long turned into a mere lump of iron, while his armor was a mess of holes. Even the white robe of life had her pure, white robe stained with red here and there. Is this the end dot, but just as he was about to give up, the screams of goblins resounded in the forest. He made it. With a shield bigger than even Yugal's, it was none other than the Herculean, Wyatt of the Blood Oath of the Flying Swallow, Swallow Clan, who protected them. It would have been pretty bad if not for the sign, actually, the hawk, I'd fick joked. Leave the rest to us, the mage slayer, Mill, who suddenly appeared behind them said. As the goblins screamed in pain, the swing of a great sword cut through the air. Clad around the great sword were, as his two names implied, a storm of wind. Ha 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 ha. Die. Die, filthy monsters. The storm knight, Golan, a raging soul of violence and might. With the swing of his great sword the goblins came flying to the trees, 
and goblin after goblin were slayed together with their clubs and stakes. The great sword known as Blue Lightning made short work of the goblins. He was truly the embodiment of the word, hero. How do you describe a scene like that? G.I. Zo could not think of it, but one such word would be, despair. As far as G.I. Zo was concerned, the only thing he could think of was that a human was attacking them. Just a while ago, they were pursuing a group of strong humans. When they caught up, they managed to push them into a corner, and were even about to finish them off. But then all of the sudden, everything changed. A great sword clad in storm called upon the winds, and suddenly, they found themselves on the losing end. B. Bastard, they were going to lose. The indisputable truth before him overwhelmed him. No. This can't go on. Be that as it may, however, they couldn't just stand by doing nothing either. They might not be able to win, but they had to fight. At the very least, he needed to buy time. Retreat. All of you retreat. Someone needs to make it back to the village. As he ordered his subordinates, he shot a water bullet to the humans that just entered the fray. But that water bullet was easily cut by a female adventurer. The water bullet that was flying in the air was cut cleanly by the sharp nails of her talons. Poorly matched. A few words left her lips before she ran for G.I. Zo. In the blink of an eye, she was right in front of him. G.I. Zo shot more water bullets at her, but they all merely dissipated. The Mage Slayer. In her talons lay absolute power against Aether, and when she brandished them against G.I. Zo, he immediately turned to take some distance. Wah! But the storm right behind her had already cut G.I. Zo. By the time he'd taken some distance, he was already a thousand, tiny little pieces. Gullen, you dare! Without the slightest concern for Mill, Gullen continued to hack away at his next prey. Don't dawdle, young lady, he said. Unless you want to be killed by me. His lips twisted a cruel smile as he slaughtered the goblins one after another. Name. Gullen Rifnine Race. Human Level. 88 Job. Holy Knight, Storm Knight, Traveler, Seeker of Monster Dens, Frenzied Sword, Soul of a Crazed Warrior, Possessed Skills. Strong Arm. Swordsmanship A, Charisma, Raging Greed, Hundred. Demon Slayer, Fire God's Blessing, Rebellious Spirit Divine Protection. Fire God Attributes. Fire Equipment. Blue Lightning, Great Sword, Strong Arm, Prevents Backlash when using a skill. Charisma, Other People Will Respect You. Increases Influence. Seeker of Monster Dens, Note. Previously translated as Daredevil, when fighting in dungeons, strength and mana are raised. Low, frenzied sword, slash consecutively against a distant target with a storm of swords. Soul of a crazed warrior, strength will multiply several times in exchange for one sanity. Raging greed, the chance of stealing item from a defeated enemy is increased. If the target doesn't have any items, damage will increase. 100. Demon Slayer, regeneration increased after defeating a monster. Low, mana is increased. Medium, fire god's blessing, damage from fire is reduced. High, rebellious spirit, note. Previously translated as rebellious. Might just be a mistake in my notes. When fighting against a higher classed opponent, mental attacks are negated. Author's note. Goblin Fatalities G.I. De, G.I. Zo, and Normal Goblins Human Fatalities Non-Goblin Casualties 20 Normal Goblins Human Casualties None, Note The White Hand of Life Healed Them Volume 2, Intermission G.I. Ga's Decision You Are Listening at NovelFull.Audio Name G.I. G.A. Rax Race Goblin Level 89 Class Noble, Guardian Possessed Skills Spearmanship C+, Overpowering Howl, Omnivorous, Instant Kill, Adherent of the King, 
spear throwing, warrior soul, indomitable soul, insight divine protection. None attributes. None the village was a flickering flame by the time GIGA Rax returned. Did something happen? There were fewer goblins than usual, and the water mage, G.I. Zo, who would always greet him was nowhere to be seen. Lord G.I. Ga. It was the spear-wielding goblin, G.I. De, who greeted G.I. G.A. upon his return. The puzzled G.I. G.A. asked what all the commotion was about, and when he found out what happened, he got off his mount to think. Lord Alashed, forgive me, but it seems we'll have to put off our farewell party for later. So it seems. Alashed only nodded as he took his spear when G.I.G.A. said that. He seemed completely unperturbed. We have a custom in our tribe where we knock our spears to promise that we will one day meet again. Brave warrior, G.I.G.A. Rax, I believe you are qualified to make such an oath. Would you do me the honor? G.I.G.A. was taken aback. He knew very well how proud the goblins of Paragil were, so he understood the significance of Alashed's words. The honor is mine, G.I.G.A. said as he brought up his spear, and lightly knocked against Alashed's. May we both live to meet another day, Lord G.I. Ga onwards. Alashed took off on his mount, riding faster than the wind for Paragua village. He could have defended the village with G.I.G.A., but there was a restlessness within that he could not ease. It was not as if he had ever met a human, but from the report he'd heard, the humans were both powerful and cruel. If so, then reinforcements would be necessary. Though somewhere in his heart, he hoped that it wouldn't. Please make it in time. To Alyahalia, and to the king. They must be informed of this threat. And so, the goblin of Paragua, though pained, rode like the wind on black. Tiger got back to reach the village if only a moment sooner. G.I. Zo was dead. The moment that report reached his ears, G.I. G.A. decided to abandon the village. And he gathered the humans to the village square to inform them of that decision. We will go through the lake to take refuge at the fortress where the king resides. Everyone was surprised at his decision. Reshia, the humans, and even G.I. De and the rest of the goblins. We don't know how strong the enemy is, but more than anything else, we can't risk putting the king's treasure in danger. Then what's going to happen to this village? The one who raised his voice was a male human. It was one of the newer men, but G.I.G.A. couldn't recall his name. We abandon it, G.I.G.A. firmly replied. No, the man screamed. Is the enemy that strong? It was Lily who asked that. Reshia seemed to be brooding over something, as her head was hung down. G.I. De and G.I. Zo are both dead, G.I. G.A. replied. The other twenty normals have also been done in. The staggering number of casualties greatly shocked the humans who weren't used to fighting. Moreover, that twenty was the cream of the crop amongst the goblins of this village. The strength of the enemy was not something that could be matched even with G.I. Ga. If you can't agree with this decision, then it's fine. It doesn't matter. But the king's treasure, Lady Rescia, you must come with us. The male humans looked at each other. How were they to protect their young and women? But, one of the men tried to say, but G.I.G.A. shot him down. The decision is final, he curtly replied. Lady Rescia, please begin your preparations. Rescia was brought to the king's house at G.I. Ga's urging, and then Lily not long after. The men who were still at the square all looked at each other, wondering what they would do. In the end, the humans split. Some would go with Rescia, while some would stay behind in the village. But regardless of their decision, the goblins all left the village. Golan, G.I. Zo's killer, spent the night in that same area to reach out to the others and meet up. The White Hand of Life was already with them, so the only one missing was the Wand of Destruction, Belen. It wasn't until a day later that they rendezvoused with him, and then the adventurers all talked about what happened in their quests, as well as what they planned to do next. Not one man was missing, so all the adventurer groups reported their success. At most, we stumbled onto an orc or two, 
but that's about it, there's no big catch or anything, Gullen said, to which Wyatt nodded. That leaves the goblin faction then, he said. I find the goblins to be a greater threat than the orcs, the adventurer, Vitz, interjected as he looked toward the white hand of life. Right, there were a lot of them, said Wyatt before becoming thoughtful. But it sure is rare for them to fight more than the orcs. Were they isolated? Or is it because they have a powerful leader? I also believe the goblins are a greater threat, the wand of destruction, Bellin, who rarely spoke said. Normally, he would leave the talking to Wyatt. Was there something he had in mind? A rare sight, Wyatt said. When he noticed people staring at him, Bellin explained. There was a rare dot class among the goblins, but he wasn't their leader. He was a small fry. There's probably a big one behind the goblins, dot, are you implying there's a noble class? Wyatt asked. Bellin shaking his head made the adventurers look at each other. A duke then. But in a place like this. Wyatt said, pondering. Then with a ferocious grin on his face, Golan loudly spoke. It's decided. We're going after the goblins. Wait, what about the saint? Asked the mage killer, Mildora, burning her the sharp glare of the hero adventurer, Golan. If the saint is yet alive, the white hand of life interjected. Then she's probably with the strongest monsters of the area. If so, then she's probably at the village of the goblins. Gullen sneered as he watched Mill reluctantly step down. After he announced their departure first thing in the morning, the adventurers all dispersed. Mill, can I speak to you for a moment? It was Wyatt who said that. What? Mill impatiently replied. Wyatt smiled an elderly and gentle smile in return. Is there something troubling you? You seem to have a hard time with Golan. She was a woman known to quietly do her job. It was rare to see her that talkative. I took this job because he said he would rescue the saint. But that guy is, Wyatt couldn't help but laugh when he saw her act like a sulking kid. It's not like Golan said he has no intentions of saving the saint. Then he should work harder. Mill, with a gentle pat on her head, the old man acted more like a father admonishing his child than a co-worker. It's not that I don't see where you're coming from. I mean the saint is, to some extent, no matter how small, somewhat related to you, right? Pitying the girl lightly nodding her head, Wyatt added. Don't worry, I'm sure she's alive. After we defeat the goblins and save her, you should stand by her side and protect her. After seeing her nod her head again, Wyatt let go of her head with a wry smile. Sleep well, okay. You too, Wyatt. Cheeky kid. Name. Mildora Race. Half-elf level. 49 job. Skilled assassin possessed skills. Mixed soul, fire god's blessing, one who shuns magic an elf's tale, rebellious spirit, silent moon, jack of all trades, divine protection. Fire God Attributes Fire status agility is increased due to being 1.4th elf mixed soul, elf and humans will shun you. Low, physical abilities increased. Low, fire God's blessing, you have the blessing of the God of fire. Resistance to fire increased. Medium, regeneration increased. Medium, an elf's tail, you can control freely control your presence in the forest. One who shuns magic, magic casted by enemies with a lower class than yours will have no effect. Medium, silent moon, hides your presence. Preemptive strike for the first blow. If the attack fails, damage received will be doubled. Jack of all trades, Mastery to all weapons is raised to see. Author's note. A quarter is a quarter, but when it comes to the blood of other races mixing, like in the case of an elf's and a human's, a quarter is considered half. So Mill would be called a half-elf. But that's only in name, and in the end, unless atavism occurs or something, the ability she can muster would be only at the level of a quarter. Blood. 
In the case of goblins mating with humans, the resulting offspring is almost always a goblin. So, the male seed is dominant. Which is why they can kidnap the female of other races, and do this and that. In Mildora's case, her grandpa is human, deceased, and her grandma is an elf, whereabouts unknown. Her parents are both humans, both deceased, so her case is already that of atavism, as she's able to use the abilities that came from her grandmother. It's because of those abilities that she was able to become an adventurer with a second name. To sum it up. Goblin x human equals goblin. Human x elf equals human or elf. Volume 2, Intermission. Those who chase and those who are chased you are listening at novelfull.audio. Name. G.I. De Race. Goblin Level. 36 Class. Rare Possessed Skills. Spearmanship C, Knowledge of the Spear, Spear Throwing, Overpowering Howl, Unreasonably Stubborn Divine Protection. None Attributes. None the fleeing goblins could not run as fast as they could because of the humans and the pregnant goblins, but they still orderly left the village with G.I.G.A. racks at the lead and G.I. de right behind. A full day had passed since G.I.G.A. and his men left the village. At this time, Alasht had already arrived where the king was. And though dirty and unwashed, the first thing he sought was an audience with the king. He told the king of the human threat approaching the village. A look of shock appeared on the king's eyes, but that was all, and it was only for a moment. Gather the men. The king said. We set off at once. Kuzan will defend the fortress. With Kuzan watching over the fortress, the king left the fortress with the rest of the goblin army. At the lead was G.I.G.I., G.I., followed by the young chieftain of Parajua, Hal, and the king himself leading the rest of the tribes. Like this the goblin army headed east. Meanwhile, the adventurer group led by Goan was forced to stop a day's distance from where G.I. Zo was killed. Goan, that bastard. Golan heaved and fumed as he looked for Goan Ranid, who was yet to arrive. It can't be helped. We'll have to wait. Even we can't move without supply, Wyatt said as he tried to calm the fuming Golan. It's because the only thing he has going for him is that big body of his, Mills said in a rare moment of agreement with Golan, clearly annoyed at not being able to leave despite already breaking camp. We mustn't be hasty. This too is the will of God, the white hand of life generously said, to which Vitz and Yugal who were already used to her antics looked at each other, and Riley smiled. Now as for why the adventurers found themselves at a standstill here, the answer was quite simple. It's because they have no supplies. The three holy knights originally agreed to go their own ways, but the land-seeking Goan and the hunt-seeking Golan saw an opportunity to be had. In order to achieve their own goals, the both of them decided to neglect the mission of saving the saint. Goan wanted land and Golan wanted to hunt. One was a feudal lord who wished to expand his territory and the other was a famous adventurer. It wasn't hard to see that they could benefit from each other if they just put away their emotions and work together. The feudal lord would provide the supplies. Food, water, medicine, and other goods, while the adventurer would cut down the monsters, and clear the land. Well, you are a cowardly bastard who can't even protect himself, Golan said. Just think of it as me hiring a pack of watch dogs, Golan calmly replied. It was in this way that the two of them came to an agreement, and as a result, the adventurers couldn't stray too far from the feudal lord and his men lest they wished to find themselves without supplies. The adventurers wanted to go hunt the rest of the goblins, but couldn't because the feudal lord's group was too slow. But that was to be expected, after all they were building a road as they followed from behind. There might not be any monsters left for them to fight, but they still had to pull out the trees and dig out the ground, so of course they were going slow. Adventurers could normally go into a dungeon with a week's worth of supply, but the location of the goblin village was uncertain. There was no telling how far they would have to walk before they would find it, because of that they couldn't stray too far without the feudal lord's supply. 
To adventurers knowing the exact location of the dungeon and having plenty of resources are the two most important conditions when hunting. It wouldn't do to attack a dungeon, and then die of hunger afterwards. The adventurers knew this well. All the more so when said adventurers are first-rate, so even Golan himself couldn't push forward. Damn it. He cursed. Yet despite that he still ordered for camp to be made. They would have no choice but to wait. Two days later they got their supplies. As soon as they received their supplies, Golan and his men took off like a pack of wolves on the hunt for a flock of sheep. When Golan saw that, he said with an expressionless face. Take the Yuan scouting party, and follow the adventurers. As you command. His cold gaze ever followed the backs of the adventurers. The horde of runaways continued to flee to the north. G.I.G.A. fought the monsters that blocked their path mostly by himself, as G.I. De and the other warrior goblins were at the back. G.I.G.A. personally arranged for this to ensure the safety of the rear in the case the humans managed to catch up. It was not easy traveling through the forest without road. It took them two days just to get through and reach the lake, then from there, they headed west. Their goal was the rocky mountain that G.I. Go once lived in. There were few monsters around it, being the former home of the Grey Wolves, so G.I.G.A. thought it would be a good place to rest. The beast tamers carried the injured goblins on their beasts, while a member of G.I. Go's old tribe guided them. Kisha while they were resting by the bank of the lake, a familiar cry reached his ears along with the sound of humans screaming. Lizard men. G.I.G.A. approached them with a spear on his only hand, while G.I. De watched his back. The lizard men were an enemy he'd once met on this same shore, so he stopped momentarily before them. He did not miss the opening they showed when one one of them brandished its curved sword, and in the next moment, a spear was lodged right into the chest of a lizard man. Magnificent. G.I.G.A. used his long reach to defeat the lizard men from afar, while G.I. De took care of the approaching ones with his short spear. In less than five minutes, they managed to take down five lizard men. G.I.G.A. was filled with emotion as he looked down their corpses. Seeing that, G.I. De called out to him. Is something the matter? He asked. I once fought with the king here, Gia Gia replied. Back then the king ordered him to fight, and he fought until he could no longer move. The king had to step in to save him. He was so young and inexperienced then. He couldn't help but laugh bitterly when he thought that, though at the same time it strengthened his resolve. The king, his king, is waiting for them in that direction. I can't die now. His feelings renewed, G.I.G.A. prepared to leave again. It's a village, Fick said as his skill, true sight of the hawk, revealed the path on the other side of the trees. How many? Mill asked, being one of the two along with Fick who were tasked to go scout. They were chosen because of their quickness, as that meant they would definitely be able to bring back info to the group. There's not a lot. At most, there's. Five, all right. Let's go back for now. Fick and Mill went back to report to Golan and his men. When they came back Golan and Belen were butting heads. Did something happen? Fick asked, while Mill was somewhat impressed, as that was not something she could see herself doing. Dot, it doesn't sit right with me, being watched like that from the back, Belen bitterly said. When Mill asked Wyatt for an explanation, he wryly smiled as he looked toward the direction they came from. Apparently, Lord Ranid doesn't trust us much. Can't say I fault him though. Mill followed the direction he was looking, and there she saw a party of scouts peeping at them. It doesn't sit well with me either, she said. Indeed, Fick agreed. But they couldn't push them away either. They were free to do as they wished after all, so the adventurers shifted their attention to Mills and Fick's report. No way there's only five of them. Not a chance in hell that's happening with a goblin horde of that scale, Bits mumbled, to which Yugo nodded. Are you saying you can't trust my true sight of the hawk? Dot. Fick unhappily asked. What they mean is that it's probably a trap, 
the white hand of life added. The group of adventurers became thoughtful at those words. Doesn't matter, Golan said. We'll just beat them all up even if it is a trap. It didn't matter how strong the goblins were if there were only five of them. Any complaints? No. Then let's go. With the great sword of blue thunder on his back, Golan bolted off for the village with the adventurers in tow. Name. Thick Barbad Race. Human Level. 78 Job Skilled Adventurer Possessed Skills. True Sight of the Hawk, Meld, Shadow Walker, Dog Nosed, Swordsmanship C+, Archery C+, Divine Protection. None Attributes. None True Sight of the Hawk, Ignore Obstacles in the Way to See the Enemy. Has no effect on enemies over two classes above one's own. Meld, hides one's presence to stealthily approach the enemy. Shadow Walker, vision isn't hindered by dark places. Dog Nosed, can follow the trail of scent with the accuracy of a dog's nose. Author's Note G.I.G.A. finds himself reminded of a certain king who hasn't been showing up lately. It takes about ten days to get to the fortress of the abyss, but that's while walking and hunting for food. And only when going there for the first time, it's a lot faster when you know the way. Now I wonder if that reinforcement is going to make it. Volume 2, Intermission The Witching Hour You Are Listening at NovelFull.audio Name G.I. De Race Goblin Level 36 Class Rare Possessed Skills Spearmanship C, Knowledge of the Spear, Spear Throwing, Overpowering Howl, Unreasonably Stubborn Divine Protection None Attributes None as the adventurers kick down the door of every house, they warily ask the humans they found of the goblins' whereabouts. Where are they? Bellin asked in that interrogative manner he'd picked up when he was still a knight, while Mill asked the women left in the village about the saint. As a result, they were able to confirm that the saint was in fact still alive, and so they hurried their pace even as they kept a watchful eye out. Lopping off the protruding branch and kicking off the ground, they chased after the goblins with hastened gait. Mill led from the front. After confirming the saint's survival, her desire to save her reached the peak, and she could not help but take the most dangerous position of them all. As someone who was originally famed for her speed, her haste made the group of adventurers go even faster. Still, there was a limit to the distance one could cross in a day. Half the day later, they reached a lake and happened upon a group of lizard men. The ghastly mill and the war. Loving Golan made short work of them, then they hurried themselves even more. But in the end, they had to stop to make camp when the day came to a close. Just a little bit more. If we go just a little further, Mill pestered, but Gullen firmly shook his head. Wyatt, Mill turned to Wyatt. But he only agreed with Gullen. Sorry, but he's right this time. Mill drooped her shoulders at that. Actually, Fick said when he saw the downhearted maiden. If you don't mind accompanying me alone, I still have to patrol the area. Wyatt Riley smiled when he saw Fick wink after saying that, while Gullen just said that they could do whatever they want. Shortly after, Mill left with Fick. Then after an hour of searching around the camp, Fick came to a halt. Well paint me green and call me a goblin, Fick said with an expression that wanted to laugh but couldn't. What? Is something there? Mill asked. You bet, a huge horde of almost a hundred of them gobs, Fick said as he quietly traced back his steps, planning to retreat, but when he saw Mill, he stopped. Hey. Fick quietly called. What are you doing? Thank you, Phil, Mill said. Lady Rescia is there. I have to save her. Fick managed to catch her by the shoulder before she left. Quieting his voice as much as he could, he rebuked her. Are you stupid? Look at the situation. The sun had already set. With darkness everywhere, it was no longer a time of man but of monsters. Fighting in this darkness, in which the monsters could fight at their best, was nothing short of suicide. Let go. 
Mill said as she struggled with Fick, but then they both heard something sound from the thickets. Like a pair of deer caught in the headlights, the both of them stood frozen still for a moment before deciding to retreat. We're going, okay. Damn it. Just wait, Lady Reziha. I'll definitely save you. The two adventurers quickly retreated from the goblin horde. Dnoel.n meanwhile, Goen ran it stopped at the village the adventurers left. Before him was a plate of simple food no different from what his men ate, a pile of paperwork that needed to be done, and the residents of this village. So why are you people here? He asked as he signed the papers, then he looked at the men with that ever cold gaze of his. We were, the man hesitated for a moment. The man who answered for the group was the man in charge of the building of the fences around the king's house and the rest of the village. His hesitation at answering did not escape the feudal lord's cold eyes. Those eyes that seemed to be looking at something rather than someone. We were kidnapped by the goblins, the man's wife answered for him. Her husband glanced at her with shock, but she was clearly emphasizing that they were in fact kidnapped. I see. It must have been difficult, the feudal lord said. The couple heaved a sigh of relief. If that is all, then I welcome you to my fief. Rest assured you will be protected along the way, the feudal lord said. Thank you very much, the husband said. You are dismissed. Like that the feudal lord, Ranid, hastily settled the issue of the five residents. Was that all right? His adjutant asked. Their women might be of child, of goblin child that is, it's fine. Only Goen's eyes moved to answer him. Once they return to my territory, they will have to pay all unpaid taxes. Goblins are of little relevance. The adjutant swallowed his breath upon hearing that. Goen apparently figured that they must have ran from another fief, and was apparently intending on making them pay the taxes they failed to pay once they return. Commoners fleeing a fief wasn't rare. On the contrary, it was quite common. And that was so for just a year's worth of tax. These people must have been missing for some time now. It wouldn't be odd if these people missed at least two years of tax. That was not something they could possibly account for. At least, not unless they sold a relative or two to slavery anyway. Yet the feudal lord remained as cold as ever, not a hint of emotion or sympathy on him despite knowing that, reminding the adjutant again of why this man was so fearsome. It should be about time for our pack of dogs to catch something. Yes, Goen analyzed the information he received from his scouts with the time the goblins left to make a prediction. His adjutant would find something like this divine or godlike, but to him it was just a matter of fact. Gather the squads. We shall trample the goblins with those pack of dogs, he said. But it's already late, if we go now, the adjutant argued. The knight was the monster's friend, so Goen could understand his adjutant's apprehension. Of course, I will be leading. You need only watch the surroundings of the village, and ensure that the fire keep burning. As you will. His gaze ever cold, reason and logic wove within his mind as he sought only to attain the best results. The ancient beast tamer, G.I.G.I., G. I., and how rode at the king's behest, taking with them twenty of Paragua's iron-legged riders. As a horde consisting purely of riders and beast-tamers, they rode at a speed unknown to those who could only walk. And after only a night of riding, they had already crossed half the journey. Gruuu, the goblins wore a grim face. They had been riding all this time with nary a rest in between. Even the black tigers they rode upon were dyed in the color of fatigue. But even then, they rode, following the ancient beast tamer, Gigi, who rode upon his large, horned ostrich triple head. When they passed through some thicks, Hal spoke. Let's rest here for a bit. Understood, Gigi said. He grit his teeth in frustration as he looked toward the direction of the village. If they kept going like this, they would reach somewhere near the village a day later. If so, then it might be possible to rendezvous with the goblins. As he fed the triple head some dried fruits, he leaned his back to the ostrich's large body and closed his eyes. 
by doing so, he would only hear the breath of the rider beasts. Asterisk rustle but then the sound of thickets rustling reached his ears, and G.I.G.I. G.I. opened his eyes. From out of the darkness of his vision, he noted a circle of faintly, dazzling green. Opening his eyes just big enough to see a rider beast, he searched around the circle of green light, where he found the breath of man clearly resound. Humans. G.G.I. whispered. There's an elf too, Hal added. The goblins did not know this, but that group of elf and humans was actually none other than Jean's group, who were using the elven path. What a pain. Let's go around them, Hal said, to which G.I.G.A. asked with his eyes whether it was alright not to finish them off here now. And Hal responded, what we have to do now is not to protect some elf or hunt some human, but to protect those goblins from the village. So they woke up their beasts, and they ran away from that ring of green light and rode for the eastern goblin village. On the morning of the fifth day since leaving the village, war descended like a fierce storm. The divine god is great, confusion, we're under fire. As soon as word of an attack resounded, the spell of confusion came. Soldiers came in droves without order and attacked them before the goblins could tell what was happening. G.I. De, take Lady Rescia, and run. G.I.G.A. said. Lord Lily, I leave the rest to you. G.I.G.A. jumped onto his black tiger and rode into the fray. He left Rescia to the spear dot wielding G.I. De and the rest of the humans to Lily. As for him, he would deal with the opposing humans himself. Three goblins, one group. The humans are nothing as long as we work together. G.I.G.A. ordered. At his behest, the once confused goblins woke up and fought the humans. Goblins were originally stronger than humans. It was only because of the human's intellect that allowed them to take an edge over the goblins. So what happens then when the goblins themselves make use of that same intellect? The answer was simple, the humans would fall into a disadvantage. Moreover, what is that goblin? It's riding on something. The entrance of the never dot before seen rider dot beast and the goblin with an unusually long arm riding it shocked the men, as he pierced one soldier through the chest with his iron spear, and swung it while it was still lodged into the man. The man's body flew through the sky before crashing into the ground. Whatever psychological or physical advantage the humans may have gotten at the start was suddenly blown away. Onwards. G.I.G.A. led the goblins against the humans who attacked them by surprise. But despite their unfavorable start, G.I. Ga's wise response allowed them to bring the fight back to the humans. Name. Wyatt Kenoba Race. Human Level. 65 Job. Expert Adventurer Possessed Skills. Vajra, Shield Rush, Steadfast, Inspire, Sword Mastery B, Axe Mastery C+, Veteran, Divine Protection. None Attributes. None Vajra. Defense is temporary greatly increased, but physical strength is slightly reduced along with physical attack. Shield Rush, can attack with the shield. The shield won't be damaged when this ability is used. Steadfast, endurance will recover unless attacked by the enemy. Medium, inspire, suppresses the confusion of your allies. Medium, raises the morale and physical attack of your allies. Low. Veteran, critical rate is increased when fighting against someone of a lower class, while defense is increased when fighting someone of a higher class. Authors note. The boundaries separating man from monster grow ever thinner. Who do you like the most? The steadily pursuing Golan, Goan, or perhaps the Eerie Gene. Note. Changing swordsmanship to sword mastery for the sake of uniformity amongst the weapon mastery skills. E.g. Sword Mastery C+, Axe Mastery C+, etc.